Hi, I'm Dr. Jeff Glad, Chief Medical Officer of Fullscript, the leading healthcare platform for providers to prescribe healthcare's best supplements, drive better patient outcomes, and scale practice growth with unparalleled efficiency. As a healthcare provider, I know that finding time to stay up to date on the latest trends and research in modern medicine can be a daunting task. That's why I'm excited to share a cutting edge supplement course our team of medical experts worked on in collaboration with A4M and several industry experts designed to help you navigate supplements and make more informed clinical decisions. Throughout the 16 hours of content, we'll give you the clinical context you'll need to confidently recommend supplements to your patients. The A4M Supplement Certification course is the perfect starting point or clinical update for optimizing your supplement treatment plans to ensure the best possible outcomes for your patients. Go to www.a4m.com slash supplement dash certification dash course dot html and use the promo code podcast20 at checkout to get a 20% discount. Enroll today and elevate your whole person care. Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. Our host for Redefining Medicine is Dr. Erica Schwartz. For more than 20 years, Dr. Erica has been at the forefront of advanced patient care, taking the best from conventional and integrative medicine and applying them to prevent disease. Dr. Erica is a distinguished A4M faculty member in disciplines ranging from hormone therapy, peptide therapy, and IV nutritional support. Hi, welcome to Redefining Medicine. We are in Boston at the Pediatric Immune Health Summit speaking with Dr. Robert Lustig. Thank you, Dr. Lustig. My pleasure. So I had the pleasure and the honor of being at your talk yesterday. And you are actually an academician, so you can talk from both sides of the aisle. And as you know, from where I sit as an internist, that obesity is killing everybody, and there's no reason for it. And pediatrics is where it actually starts. So tell us, please, well, from I won't, your perspective. I won't disagree that it starts in pediatrics. No argument there. Uh, but the fact is, it's happening all over the world, not just in America. And the reason is because the environment has changed all over the world, not just America. And children, of course, are the most vulnerable. In addition, the development of obesity is a pediatric problem, whereas the maintenance of obesity is an adult problem. Correct. And you have to solve the problem at its source. So it right. really does need to be solved in pediatrics, that's true. However, the problem really actually is not obesity. Obesity is a marker for the problem. It's not actually the problem itself. There are three fat depots. The fat you can see, subcutaneous fat, which turns out to be actually protective against chronic metabolic disease. That's where your body wants to put extra energy. It's designed for that. The second fat depot was not designed for that. That's called the visceral fat. Now, the visceral fat is actually due to stress. And then finally, the third fat depot, the one that is the most important and the one that is very specifically diet related and regulated is the liver fat. And what we have learned is that the liver fat is the biggest problem in all of obesity because when your liver gets sick, then your pancreas has to make more insulin to cover the liver's mistakes. And that extra insulin is what drives the adiposity. So fixing the liver turns out to be job one. Now, fixing the liver means reducing the substrate that causes the problem. That's called sugar, and in adults, also alcohol. And it also means suppressing the inflammation that drives reactive oxygen species formation in the liver. 
And in order to do that, that means feeding the gut. And so protecting the liver, feeding the gut are the two basic precepts to not just fix obesity, not just fix metabolic syndrome, but in fact, to fix chronic metabolic disease across the board and also immune health. And that's what I talked about here. You did, and I loved it. And I think your slide where you showed toxic food, which was that hamburger disgustingness, and then that food can be medicine, was the last slide, and it was the most demonstrative of what we're talking about. Yeah. Give us a little bit of insight, yeah. please. So the world is suffering from eight diseases, eight diseases, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, fatty liver disease, polycystic ovarian disease. This is 75% of healthcare dollars today. This is breaking medicine, these eight. And none of those eight have a cure. None of those eight even have a treatment. Now, we have treatments for the symptoms of those diseases. So, for cardiovascular disease, we have high LDL. We have statins for high LDL. The LDL is not the disease, it's the symptom of the disease. Right, right. We have oral hypoglycemics and insulin for high blood glucose. The high blood glucose is not the disease, it is the symptom right. of the disease. Right. We have antihypertensives for high blood pressure. The high blood pressure is the symptom of the disease. The endothelial function is still going on. It's like giving an aspirin to a patient with a brain tumor because they have a headache. Might help the headache, ain't going to do a damn thing for the brain tumor. Yeah. And that's the way medicine has been treating each one of these chronic metabolic diseases. The fact is, each one of these diseases is a disease because of mitochondrial dysfunction. The thing that all eight of those diseases share are mitochondrial dysfunction right. in different organs, therefore with different symptoms, but inability to generate ATP at the appropriate rate because of defective mitochondrial function. Okay. Are there any medicines that get to the mitochondria? No. Not one. <laughs> None. Right. Okay. Mitochondria are impervious to medicines. Right. So, what does get to the mitochondria? Food. Food. But, the, mito but the mitochondria can either be helped by food or it can be hurt by food. Okay? Different foods will help mitochondrial function. I'll give you an example. One food that helps mitochondrial function is glucose. Mm. Glucose stimulates two enzymes involved in improved mitochondrial function, AMP kinase and hydroxyacyl-CoA dehydrogenase. That's a good thing. It actually ups your game. But when you say sugar, people don't understand. They think sugar is a piece of ice cream well, or a piece of cake. Well, it is <laughs> because, <laughs> in fact, dietary sugar is two molecules. Mm -hmm. One's called glucose. One's fructose. called fructose, right. And it turns out the fructose molecule is not helpful to mitochondria. It's the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. It inhibits three enzymes. It inhibits AMP kinase. It inhibits ACAD-L, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase long chain. And it inhibits carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1, CPT1A, which is necessary to regenerate carnitine, which is the shuttle mechanism for getting the fats into the mitochondria in the first place. The sum total of which is that when you consume dietary sugar, you're actually inhibiting mitochondrial function. Sugar is a mitochondrial toxin, and sugar consumption has been shown to make every single one of those eight diseases that I just mentioned worse. I couldn't agree more. But when you say that, you're confusing these people because they don't understand because they're thinking sugar. You said on one hand, sugar works. On the other hand, sugar doesn't work. No, but glucose But what you're saying works. is glucose 
and fructose. That's right. And I think we need to start understanding it. And I think we need to be very specific when right. we discuss it. Right. You know, <clears throat> medicine has made this mistake many times. We have two different definitions for sugar. We have blood sugar, which is blood glucose. We mm -hmm. have dietary sugar, which is glucose fructose. They're not mm -hmm. the same. We have two different definitions for weight, right? right. We, have, we have two different def definitions for fat. Right? We have right. body fat and dietary fat. The fact of the matter is, we, when we mix these up, we actually do the food industry's job for them because we are providing subterfuge. Right. We are ourselves providing propaganda because we are not speaking clearly, correctly, and to the public. So how can we, how can we start explaining to our providers so they can understand and they can start being able to separate what helps versus what harms. Right. So what people need to realize is that food can be medicine. You know, there's everybody yelling, food is medicine, food is medicine. <laughs> it can be medicine. I'm not saying it can't. It can. But food can also be poison. Yes. And we've known this for a long time, except we usually think of food as an acute poison rather than as a chronic poison. Okay, we think of food safety, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, infection and things like that. No, no, no. We're talking long term. Right. Okay. In the same way, we might cons look at a cigarette. Okay. One cigarette won't kill you, but 10,000 might. One candy bar won't cortisol. kill you, but 10,000 might. But as you look at cortisol, it, it's stress. That's right. And acute stress is great. That will make your blood flow and be right. good for you. But chronic stress will make you sick. Absolutely. So it's chronic the same stress thing. chronic stress is what drives that visceral fat. Exactly. And that visceral fat then sends cytokines to the liver, causes liver dysfunction, and now you've got chronic metabolic disease as right. well. So stress for sure, but the um, but your diet is not the cause of your visceral fat. Right. Your stress is the cause. Of your visceral right. fat. Right, 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 right. And the reason we know that is because we can take patients with endogenous depression who are losing weight, who have to be admitted to the hospital to keep them from killing themselves, stick them in an MRI scanner, and they have a reduction in subcutaneous fat because they're losing weight because they're anhedonic, they, they don't eat, right. but they're gaining visceral fat. Right. So the fact is, three different fat depots with three different defined functions. The one that matters the most in terms of food is the liver fat. And the thing that's driving that is alcohol, sugar, and branched chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, valine, which is fed, found in corn fed beef, chicken, and fish. In other words, ultra processed food. And we add that in our diet because we believe that adding amino acids will help the body regenerate, build muscle, etc. But it's got to be the right way. Well, there are different amino acids. Mm -hmm. You know, people say a protein's a protein. No, no. it's not. <laughs> okay? There are 20 amino acids, mm -hmm. only 9 of them are essential. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the ones that are the most important and the ones that are the rarest in our diet are tryptophan, which is precursor to serotonin, uh, methionine, which is a, a methyl donor and also uh, has a sulfhydryl group, uh, which helps uh, with oxidation, oxidative stress, uh, lysine, which also uh, helps, uh, and it's also uh, uh, got an amino group and charged, okay, and cysteine, which is a sulfhydryl group and therefore acts, acts as an antioxidant soaking up reactive oxygen species. Okay, and all four of those are essential amino acids. But you know what? There are some other essential amino acids like leucine, isoleucine, valine, branch chain amino acids. Now, you need branch chain amino acids because they're 20% of muscle. And so if you're a bodybuilder, you're going to put your protein powder in your smoothie and you know, mm -hmm. down it because that's going to give you excess branch chain amino acids so you can pump iron and build muscle. And that's great if you're a bodybuilder. But if, if you're not, not <laughs> You know, then what happens to those branched chain yeah. amino acids? They go to the liver, right. the liver deamidates them. Now they're branched chain organic acids. They enter the 
tricarboxylic acid cycle, overwhelm it, and then get thrown off as citrate when, and then end up as fat. So they end up increasing liver fat in the same way that fructose and alcohol did. So food can be medicine. It can also be poison. Depends on the patient, depends on the venue, depends on what else they're consuming. Point is, real food is high in fiber, feeding the gut, low in sugar, protecting the liver. Ultra-processed food is the exact opposite. It's high in sugar, flooding the liver, and low in fiber, starving the gut. And we now know that if you don't feed your gut, your gut feeds on you. It strips the mucin layer right off your intestinal epithelial cells, generating GI distress, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, leaky gut, which all leads to hepatic uh, insulin resistance and uh, reactive oxygen species, which drive adiposity, drive chronic metabolic disease, and ultimately drive death. So unfortunately, right, we focus on finding the diagnosis of what the problem is, the fatty liver, biopsying the fatty liver, which is useless, instead well, of changing the diet first. Exactly. All you've done is diagnose the symptom, but you could have done that a whole lot easier. The question is, how do you fix it? Right. The only way to fix it, because you've got to fix the mitochondria, the only way to fix it is the food. Right. Until you fix the food, nothing else matters. How do you food fix is the primary. Foods? Well, that's the hard part. <laughs> so we can educate till the cows come home. And we've been doing it, and people are starting to understand. But education is one skill, agency is another. We have to give people agency to be able to make those changes. And thus far, we have not. And government has not. And we need to work with government in order to be able to do that. The single biggest thing, people ask me all the time, you know, if you had a magic wand, what would you do? The single thing that is basically standing in the way of being able to fix this problem are food subsidies. Because, the, because they distort the market. Explain. They distort the market. Mm -hmm. okay? They're what make corn, soy, wheat, and sugar cheap. That's what makes ultra-processed food less expensive for the public. And therefore, they're voting with their wallet. What if, just what if, we got rid of all food subsidies? We'd have to get rid of all of them. The Genie Foundation at UC Berkeley actually did this exercise. They modeled what would the price of food look like if we got rid of all food subsidies. And the answer was very simple. The price of food would not change, right. except for two items, corn and sugar. Mm -hmm. They would go up. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we would want to do to reduce effective availability in order to stop this sugar glut that we are currently you know, in the throes of. So to me... We're not going to solve this problem till the government takes on food subsidies. We're working on it. It's, you know, it's a thing, but it's going to take a long time because there are a lot of people on the other side. And the physicians are getting the wrong training. Of course. Does any physician get nutrition training? Only 28% no. of medical schools even have a nutrition curriculum, oh. and those that do have a total of 19.6 contact hours. And... The training is incorrect yes. because it's 50 years old. Well, there's a, there's a word called food science, there's mm -hmm. a word called nutrition, and there's a word called metabolic health. Food science is what happens to food between the ground and the mouth. Mm -hmm. Nutrition is what happens to food between the mouth and the cell. Metabolic health is what happens inside the cell. It's an outcome of what you're saying. But... All of those diseases, all those chronic metabolic diseases happen inside the cell. So metabolic health is the true purpose of nutrition. Nutrition is only valuable as it informs metabolic health, but it is one step divorced. Food science is only valuable as it informs metabolic health, and it is two steps divorced. But we are allowing the food industry and the dietitians who are, quote, in charge of nutrition to actually dictate what we should be doing about metabolic health. No, we doctors and scientists need to do this. 
And we have to get together. Absolutely. And we have to realize that by educating the patient the way you did, because there is that disconnect, because they don't understand the metabolic health as the end point there, right. right, is how do you get them to see the connection? Right. And I'm not talking about the doctors, the providers, the bench scientists. Right. I'm talking about the patient who goes down the aisle, doesn't look at the label, and then eats something that will harm them. Well, Erica, to be very honest with you, there's nothing on the label that's helpful. If anything, nothing. it's harmful. They everyone, don't have sugar. Everyone thinks it's about calories. No. Calories nothing. are how we got into this mess. Exactly. My job, in no uncertain terms, is to kill the calorie. I'm with you. Kill I, you the calorie. You can count me in. Hashtag kill the calorie. I'm with you. Calories are useless. It was Completely. like, how many calories you're eating? You're going to lose weight, exercise more. Not That's a bit. bullshit. Absolutely. It doesn't work. And it's never worked. And it's not going to work because it's the wrong paradigm. Exactly. It is, is based on a faulty premise. Correct. And I can prove it right now. Tell me. Please do. Almonds. You like almonds? Yes. I love almonds. You eat 160 <laughs> calories in almonds. How many of those calories do you absorb? 130. What happened to the other 30? The fiber in the almonds, both soluble and insoluble, so soluble like pectin and inulin, like what hold jelly together, mm -hmm. and the insoluble, cellulose, the stringy stuff in celery, cardboard, they're, bo they're both in almonds. You eat the almonds, the soluble and insoluble fiber form a gel on the inside of your duodenum, a, like a, a fishnet plugged by kelp. Okay? And they form a secondary barrier that prevents absorption of glucose, fructose, sucrose, simple starches, some fats, rendering them unavailable for early absorption, thus protecting your liver, reducing your glycemic response, reducing your insulinemic response. Well, if you didn't absorb them early, they go further down the intestine to the jejunum where the microbiome is, and then the microbiome chews them up for its purposes you have fed the gut. So even though you consumed 160 calories at your mouth, you only absorbed 130 calories at your brush border of your intestine. So a calorie is not a calorie because it came with its requisite fiber. And it's helpful in this case. Absolutely. And you want it. Exactly. And, you know, and everybody's taking Metamucil and all kinds of stuff when you can eat food. Well, soluble fiber like right. Metamucil. Right has a role, right. but it doesn't solve all the problems, the problems, and it doesn't reduce the rate of absorption. Right. So the salutary effects of Metamucil on uh, uh, GI function and on glycemic control are actually quite small, and, and uh, uh, sorry, uh, Procter & Gamble mm -hmm. actually couldn't even get an, uh, a health claim for Metamucil. So, um, there's, there's going to be a better way soon. And we're working on it. Wonderful. We're going to follow everything you do. Thank you. Because you're at the leading edge of it. Pediatrics is the leading edge of it. Being part of A4M and bringing pediatrics to A4M is probably one of the most genius moves they've made. I am very proud to be at A4M. I'm proud to have you here. You're wonderful. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.